Thank you for joining us this afternoon for Americans uh, for Arts and Accessibility for All. My name is Louis Rickey and I'm the Executive Director at the Indiana Arts Commission. I'm a white man in my 60s. I'm wearing a color shirt and I'm sitting in my office with a quilt artwork behind me. Uh, I'm also a tenor and have a relatively high speaking voice. The Americans with Disabilities Act, also known as ADA, is turning 30 this month, but how exactly does the ADA benefit communities and the Hoosiers that live in them when it comes to the arts? And how are arts programs, big and small, creating inclusive, welcoming environments? Today, our special guests will tell us their experiences with accessibility to make more inclusive art experiences for all. Joining us today is Lou Collinger from Arts United, Aaliyah Hawkins from Beachfront Dance, and Chris Johnson from the Indiana Deaf History Museum. It is uh, my pleasure to introduce today's hosts for the webinar. First, we have Chris Johnson. As I said, Chris is uh, with the Indiana Deaf History Museum. She's museum director in Indianapolis and also serves on the IAC's Accessibility in the Arts Advisory Committee. And our second host today is my colleague, Stephanie Haynes. Stephanie is the Arts Education and Accessibility Program Manager at the Indiana Arts Commission. Take it away, Chris and Stephanie. Thanks, Lewis. Um, as he said, I'm Stephanie Haynes and I work at the Indiana Arts Commission. I am a white woman in my 30s with short blonde hair, wearing a black shirt with little pink flowers on it. And um, I'm in a room with a beige wall behind me and one piece of colorful artwork. Um, for anyone not familiar, what Lewis and I are doing are uh, to describe what we look like on the screen is an audio description introduction. That's, this is beneficial to people with low vision or people who are blind. And I'm gonna ask each presenter to introduce themselves similarly with their name, organization, job title, and a visual description. Um, Alia, would you like to start us off? Yes, uh, my name is Alia Hawkins. Um, I am in my early 40s. I African-American um, with a caramel complexion, um, medium chocolate brown hair that's short, and I have on a light mint green top, um, and I deal with about dance, more specifically classical ballet. Um, most people would think of that, of pink satin point shoes, or where you stand on your toes. Thank you. Um, and Luke? Hi, my name is Luke Holliger. I am the technical director for Arts United in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Uh, pronouns are he, him, his. Um, I am a 41-year-old male, a white male, brown, shoulder-length hair, wearing a blue shirt. I am currently sitting in a very large open space room. It's one of my theaters where we're set up for a recording sessions. So behind me, I have some recording cameras and signs and banners and curtains with the orange walls and black curtains. Thank you. And Chris. Uh, hi, I'm uh, Chris Johnson at the Indiana Deaf History Museum. I am 42 and a half years old. I'm a white woman with a crew cut hair and wearing a short sleeve uh, wine or maroon colored shirt. Uh, with windows and trees outside behind me. Thank you. Thanks to all of you for being here today. Um, I'm so glad to have this important webinar today to share some practical tips for being inclusive and making accommodations. A little bit of background, we decided to have this webinar back in May when our Accessibility and the Arts Advisory Committee made the suggestion. It would be great to have a discussion about what accessibility looks like um, in practice for arts organizations. We all know, we know that all of our grantees will check the box that they know they need to be um, ADA uh, compliant and many will do the self-assessment checklist. Um, a lot of people even call me and talk about what accommodations might be for their projects and programs. But those are usually all hypothetical conversations, the what ifs. And our committee was saying, 
Um, but what if we get together and talk about real life things that have happened and how it's possible um, and sometimes even easy to make these accommodations. So here we are. We hope today to share some practical tips and ideas for you to take away and be inspired. As a housekeeping note, um, all of you, our audience today are on Facebook while we are on Zoom. Um, we'll be monitoring the Facebook chat, but we won't be able to answer questions immediately as we're talking here. Um, at the end, there will be a Q&A time, so please feel free to answer, enter your questions um, on the Facebook chat, and we'll check those out at the end of the webinar and try to answer some of them. If anything doesn't get answered, we'll collect those up and we'll follow up with an email with some resources after this webinar. Also, we have live captioning provided for this webinar. If you are on Facebook, you can turn on the captions at the bottom of your video screen through the little gear icon that has the settings. Uh, so to get started, we're gonna go over some basics of the ADA and I'm gonna hand it over to Chris Johnson, my co-host. Okay, hi there. Um, where are the other slides are gonna come up for me? I'm sorry. I can't, I don't, I don't view the, see the slides on the screen here. There we go. All right, so uh, if you can advance to the next slide. Thank you. All right, starting off, um, first thing to emphasize to everybody is the webinar today. This is a safe space and not to, you know, judge each other. Um, you know, especially sometimes I do it all the time. I'm guilty of, you know, using maybe outdated, outdated terminology or, you know, some people are coming from very different levels of experience. Um, so this is a safe space to answer any kind of questions you have and not to feel nervous or embarrassed or, or you know, concerned about hurting somebody's feelings. This is a, a place for all of us to learn from each other. So um, we're not going to be judgy here. We're going to acknowledge that everybody is working at different levels of background information and knowledge and also different levels of accessibility within their organizations and also share your ideas with us. Um, we're always constantly learning and changing our approaches to access and inclusion, you know, as we go along. You know, um, I'm a person with, dis with disabilities and on a daily basis, I just kind of make things up as I go along sometimes just for my own benefit. Uh, so um, hopefully that we'll all learn some new things today together. Next slide, please. All right, so what's the ADA? Uh, the ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, was a civil rights law with the purpose of prohibiting discrimination against individuals with disabilities um, across er all areas of public life. That includes jobs, schools, transportation, public and private places that are open to the public. The purpose of the law is to make sure that people with disabilities have the same rights and opportunities as everyone else to participate in the communities where they live. We've been to slide, please. All right, so the, the ADA, if you go online and you look at the whole document, there's, I think there's at least 200 pages. <laughs> it's just daunting, it's a lot to read through. So uh, we wanna try to break it down to a few important key terms that you see that relates to how we are supposed to provide access to people with disabilities. So the ADA requires that businesses make reasonable modifications, or sometimes we see the words accommodations, to the usual way that we do things when serving people with disabilities. So uh, that also includes taking the steps necessary to communicate effectively with customers, visitors, um, with vision and hearing and speech disabilities. Also, another uh, important term that uh, I'd like everyone to kind of keep in the back of their mind as we go through today is the equal opportunity to benefit. So, I mean, from my own personal experience, talking to other people working in museums, people get nervous and feel overwhelmed, thinking that they have to replicate in the exact same level of experience for everybody, regard, you know, and it's daunting thinking that you have to go through every checklist and have every possible situation covered. And sometimes it's just, I mean, I like to just 
kind of tell people to take a deep breath. You don't have to do that, but you do have to provide that opportunity to benefit. So what that means is that any person with any ability level should be able to approach and use things within your, the spaces that you're working in, uh, in the arts and museums. And any person of any ability level should be able to participate in the activities and programs that you offer in your spaces. Um, and this also applies to places that you're renting. So I mean, I've had personal experiences where people have told me, well, this isn't my building. We don't have, to. It's, it's not our responsibility because we're just renting this facility. It's not true. Everybody's, everybody's on the hook to make sure that uh, programs are accessible no matter where they're offered. But that equal opportunity of benefit really is an emphasis on making sure that, um, you know, patrons, visitors to museums, customers have ways to all achieve kind of the same end goal. So nobody's going to have the exact same experience, even people without disabilities. People go to arts programs for different reasons and they leave with different uh, experiences, different ways that participation, you know, enriched them, educated them, and not everybody's going to have the same outcome. So for people with disabilities, there are very specific barriers. So there's communication barriers, there's physical barriers, there's sometimes attitudes of, you know, towards people with disabilities that sometimes are, are a barrier that affect a person's experience. So that equal opportunity to benefit is really important um, as you think through the process of approaching accessibility and inclusion is keeping that end goal in mind. So when the person, when people with disabilities leave, will they be able to say, yeah, I enjoyed that. I participated in ways that were meaningful for me and I had a positive experience. Knowing that in a lot of circumstances, depending on the type of disabilities people have, it won't be exactly the same as, uh, as what's planned for the outcome of the program for people without disabilities. But we want everybody to walk away just saying, you know what, yeah, that worked for me. I enjoyed that and I got something out of it. And that provides, you know, some flexibility for when you're adapting programs. Using people first language is something that is important. And that's typically using words that put the person, acknowledge the person as a human being first instead of making them feel like they're a medical condition. You know, so you would say like a person with a disability instead of a, oh, that disabled person, because that puts the emphasis on the disability uh, and really tends to kind of, you know, not acknowledge that this person exists as a whole uh, with, you know, other talents and interests and, and things like that. You're also saying, you know, she's a person with an intellectual or developmental disability instead of saying she's mentally disabled or, you know, using the very, very bad, using the R word, unfortunately, people still doing that. Um, but also kind of, you know, keeping in mind and going back to this is a safe space, not everybody uses the same words to describe themselves. So like for me, as, as an example, I really, I can't stand the, the terminology based on that word disability. That literally means not able. And so just for me, my personal preferences, it always kind of irks me, even though in general, I know that that's the most uh, appropriate terminology that's used right now for whatever reason it rubs me the wrong way but i use it because you know that that just seemed appropriate by most people and not a big deal for me i don't i not to get hung up on words in general um, but just uh, keep that in mind okay you don't always have to be 100 percent up to date on the verbiage you use but try to focus on people first um and then something also that's important to remember is that disability doesn't discriminate. And at least 20% of people, you know, according to the census and other uh, community censuses that are taking place over the years in smaller regions, at least 20% of the people identify as somebody with a disability. Anybody can acquire a disability at any time. And people with a disability are in every community. And again, I use myself as an example a lot. I didn't have any disabilities until I was 30 years old, and then I lost 100% of my hearing. And now I'm a person with a disability, completely unexpected. 
Um, doesn't matter if you're rich, if you're poor, if you're black, white, Hispanic, whether you're Muslim or Christian or Jewish, it doesn't matter whatsoever. Everybody's, I, I always say, everybody's eligible to join, you know, to join the club. Unfortunately, we hope that doesn't happen, but it's something to keep in mind. There's also temporary disabilities. So, you know, you say, if you, if you say, oh, this person has a disability, a lot of times people will imagine, you know, kind of like the most extreme situations of a person not being able to walk, not being able to see or hear or speak, but it could be somebody with a broken ankle. <laughs> Something as simple as that. There's all those kinds of situations too with temporary disabilities. That is it for me. I give it back to my co-host. Thanks, Chris. That was great information. Appreciate it. Now we are going to talk with our guest speakers who are people in the field making art happen every day all across the state. And they're gonna tell us about the work they do and some specific examples of accommodations they're making. I'm gonna invite Alia. Hi, Alia. Um, oh yeah, I think you're muted. Hi, yeah, how are you? I'm good. So Alia Hawkins is um, from Beachfront Dance Company. As she mentioned, she leads this ama amazing dance studio in the Miller Beach, Gary area. Um, mm -hmm. They offer uh, ballet, jazz, tap, modern. I looked on your website that you order, offer like everything um, from beginning to pre-professional. And um, today she's gonna share with us some of her experiences providing art classes and being inclusive to individuals with disabilities especially for this very physical art form. Um, so if you're watching this and your organization has hands-on activities, hands-on workshops, Alia will have some good perspectives for you. Um, so Alia, can you tell us a little bit about Beach Fret Dance and your Can Do Dance program? Yes, um, our Can Do program right now is going into roughly, I believe, fifth year. Um, and it came out of um, a little girl whose twin sister was she is what we call an able body person. Her sister, who people would call, you know, she had Down syndrome, she couldn't take the classes. And one day we had to bring a friend week and she mom said, oh, have her come into class. And her sister was so excited to join class. And um, mother was a little bit nervous. And a lot of parents with uh, children who, have disabilities or um, things that we see as people who don't necessarily have um, these different skills, and, and I'll say that later, come back to that, I get nervous because they don't know what people are going to do and say. Um, and they're just like any other parent, afraid of what other people's reactions are gonna be. And the little girl loved it, but we realized we didn't have anything to accommodate children that have special needs. So from that day on, we looked at putting a program together. And when you have a program, it has to have the right, because you can't, you can't, it can't be a name that is, it looks like your speaker was saying earlier, it, it can't be labeling the disability as, the, as, as a problem. So we selected a name that says can do, that's very positive and says that because you're, you have special needs or some kind of condition that might be different to somebody else, you can do it. And so um, our can do program was born and can do ballet and a can do uh, tap program. Awesome, great. And if you, if um, anyone watching was at the Indian Arts Homecoming, they would have heard about your program um, through our Instagram process. So it's good to hear about yeah. it again. Um, when you and I were talking before, you mentioned how you've been working and adapting your can-do program as you have new participants, but now with COVID-19, your accommodations are changing once again. So I'd love yeah. to hear you talk more about how these accommodations can change and be fluid over time in different situations. Yes, um, if you look in the news, everything that we're supposed to do as people, as citizens of the country, geared to people who are quote unquote normal. And if you have, let's hype, our students is blind. If you are blind, uh, you navigate the world touch. 
touch is everything. And now, you know, you can't hug a person who's blind. They touch every little ounce of your body to that's how they see. And so touch your face. And so you have to tell the person how to keep safe and navigate in this new normal when their sight is to touch. So we have this little jingle that we've kind of created and it kind of goes like this. And you kind of have to be flexible so that we tell people to keep safe, but we do it for everybody. It doesn't matter how old or young they are, what if they, if they have cerebral palsy, if they have you know, autism, if they have, are blind. So it kind of goes like this. Don't touch your hand. Don't, don't touch, touch your face. face. Don't, don't touch your touch eyes. eyes. Six feet, feet away. away. And wrinkle your... And I will wash my hands. But you make sure you tell a person who's blind to wash their hands. Put your fingers together and go like this. So you really wash your hands. And then sneeze in your sleeve. Put your nose down to your forearm. And it helps people do that every so it's just being flexible especially in this time because we have to be mindful of everyone yes awesome great and you're working with youth specifically yes. so mm -hmm. that also uh, that jingle seems really appropriate for you <laughs> um tell me more about the accommodations you're making maybe just some small changes from when you do your dance lessons with um, your other classes and then the can-do classes and, and what are some small changes that you made? One of the things that you do in dance, the way you teach has to, you have to be flexible to learn and to change. And actually my can-do classes are the, my favorite ones to teach because you learn every day. Every day is a new learning experience. It's really fun. And so doing right now we've been doing our classes via zoom which is a different dynamic one but people that have or that are in the can do program you have to really listen and watch and sometimes like if your internet is unstable for example um you can't say oh the internet is unstable because they don't understand it and they're thinking something is wrong with you and so i learned that way and so now I know just keep going just keep teaching don't worry about the internet just keep going be flexible it's okay it's not the end of the world and then when you are in class physically in person you have to be willing to you know don't be afraid to let people touch you and I know right now we're in the coronavirus pandemic but eventually once we get out of it don't be afraid to let people touch you uh, especially if a child is blind or Down syndrome, they're going to be so excited to see you and give a hug, embrace them because they, I mean, it's, it's important. All of us need it, but I would say this population really, really need, have to be willing to um, change what your normal is, your status quo, get out of your comfort zones and just, just reach out. Great. Um, what's one thing you hope people take away from this conversation today? Don't be afraid of different um, and be willing to look at everything. And like one of the things that I personally learned in this whole experience in this five years is we talk about the ADA and it is a, it's a civil issue. Um, but if you go into our buildings, if I'm blind, how do I navigate the world? Where's the buildings? Those are the things I personally took for granted, but now I'm looking around. Oh, wow. If I'm blind, I even, I don't even know where the bathroom is. So we have to be mindful of just little things because you never know. Somebody might not have the complete vision. We take that for granted and you have to look outside of your world and be, be don't be afraid to um, say, look, this needs to stand up for change. You know, you know, we have to love our neighbors. We really do. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Um, thank you so much. Thanks for sharing some thank of your you. tips and um, 
I really like what you're saying with, um, you have all kinds of people visiting your programming and um, uh, something I was hoping would come across today that you kind of brought up, but I'll repeat is that you just kind of have to ask what the, that particular person needs and find mm -hmm. out um, that as an individual, what are the correct accommodations for them? So yeah. Yes. thank you for sharing. Thank you so much. Um, next, I'm going to ask um, Chris to come back as my co-host. Hey, Chris. And um, she'll be talking to our next guest speaker. Okay. Let me. So I, I'm, I'm not going to zoom. I have to yeah. screen a little bit. So uh, is it possible to put me on video again? Yes. Uh, I, I have selected ask to start, so it might come up for you. There you go. I, I got it. Sorry. <laughs> I'm always the one who's like, hang on, let me figure this out. Okay, so uh, back on topic. I'm here to introduce uh, Luke Holliger, who is with, he is a performing arts tech wizard. That's what I've been told, although we haven't met in person. Uh, so he's, tech, he's the technical director for the Arts United of Greater Fort Wayne. So before joining that team with Arts United, he worked in special education for 10 years. Uh, and if you have stayed a performance space of any kind for any kind of art form, whether it's dance, orchestra, theaters, Luke is the guy to have on your side for when you need advice. Um, so we have a few questions for you, Luke. Now, can you uh, briefly just kind of describe Arts United, what kind of venues you have, what kind of work that you do there? Sure. Uh, thanks for that great introduction. Um, you know, I, I'm first of all not here to speak as an expert, just have some good experiences to share. Um, I currently operate a, an arts campus venue with uh, two indoor spaces and some outdoor festival style space. One of my theaters is, is very old and it was designed and built before ADA was really solid and in place. So we're, we have a lot of obstacles with that space and how to make it accessible and, and how to make it inclusive for everybody. Uh, my second venue is, is a convertible space, the one that I'm sitting in at the moment. Um, and because it's newer, we, we were able to put those accommodations in place. So I currently have one venue that I, that I really struggle with, and, and we're always constantly um, finding ways to improve that space. Turn the mic back on. And for that, uh, you mentioned you do have a venue that has some physical barriers. Can you give us some more details about yeah. how you've approached that or some of the barriers that still exist where maybe you know, you're struggling to find a resolution for that? Sure. Um, you know, uh, accessibility is an issue. We, there is no way to access my stage space or rehearsal spaces right now without staircases. Um, so, for example, one of our local dance companies, the Dance Collective, often will bring guest artists in. And many years ago, they brought a dance company in with individuals that are in wheelchairs. Um, and we had the obstacle of, you know, these individuals needed access, um, unrestricted access to the stage whenever they wanted to. Um, so part of my job was to advance that and, and to create that opportunity for them. You know, we partnered with uh, one of our local organizations who paid the grant to cover, to install a wheelchair ramp. It was a temporary ramp that we were able to put outside to give that, those performers access to the space um, and not just give them access there because one point of access is not quite enough. So we modified our orchestra lift to function as an elevator so that those individuals had access not just to the stage area, but now they had access to the front of house so they could go out and greet guests and stuff like that. Um, you know, again, because it's an older space, there's a lot of other things we're dealing with. Um, my hearing assist system is not where it needs to be. Um, you know, we, we've found ways to modify and adapt, but it's still not where it needs to be at this point. Architecturally, um, when they designed the space, they gave us a space for wheelchairs that were in the back of the auditorium. Um, that does not meet code anymore. We don't have a room of refuge, so I cannot safely put patrons there. So we've excuse me, we've modified and added some wheelchair seating in about the, I think this part late 80s, so they put those in. But again, it, you have to turn a sharp corner against a concrete wall. So any chair that's extended or larger in size than a standard chair is, is difficult to get in that space. Um, you know, other modifications that we're, we're, we're constantly making other modifications. So for example, 
um, when our, our ballet comes in, um, if you have an individual with a hearing disability, um, since we do a lot of student shows, uh, when if someone comes in, we would give them an inflated balloon so that that student can sit there and hold the inflated balloon and then feel that music as well so that they can see and we can get them the idea of what that music sounds like to those others through a tactile purpose. Um, you know, we, we still have not figured out at this point how to solve our rehearsal space problem. Um, we've moved classes before. If an individual needed access to that space, we've moved them possibly to our other building. Um, but, you know, we are in the process of a capital campaign for a model. And we're looking at a, a massive, expensive remodel to, to not just make this space accessible, but to move into the world of universal design. And I think that's the important part of what we're talking about when you're talking about spaces, is that um, when you build an accommodation for um, an individual that might need it, that accommodation is beneficial to all. Uh, one of my favorite examples was a, a cartoon where you see some children standing outside of a school, one in a wheelchair and, and others were um, uh, able to walk. And the custodian was shoveling the sidewalk or shoveling the stairs, with, uh, snow off the stairs. And one of the kids says, you know, if you shovel that ramp, we all could go up together. And, you know, that's something that I, I really pay attention to, that if I can modify this for an individual who might need this as their only point of access, that it really does open up for everyone. Um, you know, another example is how many times have we had to turn the closed captioning on on our TV because perhaps our chips were too loud. You know, and that again is, is an opportunity of universal, universal access that we all are able to benefit from those sort of adaptations and modifications. Uh, that's, um... Very thorough. Thank you for all of that. And I'm glad you mentioned yeah. about moving the program between buildings because that's mm -hmm. a really good example of an easy accommodation that you can make when the space yeah. is not physically uh, accessible. So yeah. um, as a result of either the permanent changes that you mean to improve access or those temporary kinds of fixes that you've been able to, to initiate there, what has been um, you know, if you have some examples of how that has benefited your audiences, either specifically for people with disabilities, but then in general, if you've received feedback from both yeah. disabled uh, people with disabilities and other patrons, what's, what's the uh, feedback been about all that you've done there? Yeah, uh, all of our organizations here have started using sensory friendly performances. Um, and we are now beginning to see, because every organization is doing it, families that come in that say, we didn't think we were ever going to be able to come to a show with my full family. You know, I may have an, uh, one child with a sensory disability, but the other one uh, may be neurotypical and I don't, I, I can't, one parent stays home while the other one goes out. Um, so being able to provide those opportunities, we've gotten a great, uh, a lot of great responses from families saying that this allowed us to enjoy something that we never would together as a family. We, we are able to get individuals who may never have seen a ballet show, may never have seen a full theater show. Um, so, so giving them an opportunity that they may not have had. Uh, one last question. So sure. what is um, one takeaway that you hope people will learn from your experience there in Fort Wayne? Yeah, it, it's not it is not hard to make adaptations and you may not be able to, to get them all. And that's the important thing. You know, if we're trying, if we're all stri moving forward to find something, we are continually increasing that access. And that again, I, I come back to universal design. You know, I, I really hope that everyone takes away that the more you make it accessible for one person, the more you make it accessible for all people. Uh, that's a, Definitely good to keep in mind. Thank you so much, Luke. I'm to pass you. back to Stephanie. Hey, great. Great discussion, guys. So um, our next guest speaker is also my co-host, Chris Johnson. I also wanted to give Chris an opportunity to share some of her work. Um, she does really great work. And so um, she's our next guest speaker. Um, Chris Johnson is the director for another third time to introduce you as the director of the Indiana Deaf History Museum located at the Indiana School for the Deaf in Indianapolis. In 2013 she received her master's in museum studies from IUPUI and her specialization is accessibility and inclusive practices 
for museums and arts organizations. So um, Chris, tell us about your museum and what's unique about it. Sure. Um, so our, our museum is unique because for a couple of different reasons. So we are, I don't like to say that we are a disability museum. Um, so right now I do want to introduce kind of the concept of the social model of disability and the medical model of disability and how context is very important with how we talk about disability. So I'm a deaf history museum. When people come to my museum, I don't tell them all about, well, you know, all the different ways that you can't hear it and we, we accommodate because that's not part, that's not why they would come to the museum. Uh, deaf people want to see the same things as, you know, deaf, deaf people are a cultural group. And so they want to see the sports awards and they want to see, you know, the past alumni who became a doctor and all that other stuff and not talk about their existence within the context of disability. Um, because people who are deaf and grow up deaf and use sign language as their first language, you know, uh, and again, I, you know, it's, it's not going to make generalizations, but they're deaf first and they're not disabled. You know, so, and I, I like to use myself as an example. I didn't grow up deaf. I was 30 years old when I became deaf and I have a cochlear implant. Sign language is not my first language. So as, as the staff member running my museum, this is what makes it unique. It's kind of like the situation has flipped. I need the accommodations because I'm the person with a disability because I can't communicate fluently with my audience. I mean, I can't, I, you know, I, I learned how to sign. I sign pretty well for not, not growing up in an ASL environment, but I struggle. And I also have physical disabilities that affect the use of my hands. So communicating in sign language is physically difficult and painful for me too. So, you know, most organizations are thinking about, well, how can we, you know, make our museum more open and inclusive for our visitors? Part of my situation here is I have to make myself <laughs> more accessible um, as the person with the disabilities in this kind of flipped context um, of the content of, of our museum. That's such a good point and what we're talking about largely so far in this webinar was about participants or audience members of arts um, experiences but I think it's a really good point to say staff you know and um, performers should also be considered people with disabilities and making accommodations to make sure they can become a part, a, a, a staff person of your organization or a, a performer of your organization. Um, so your degree is in museum accessibility, a really unique degree. Um, tell us what you think is the most important things for museums to consider when they're planning for accessibility. Um, there's, uh... There are a lot of things to consider, but what you just said, planning. Planning is probably the most important thing that you should do because when you have a plan, you don't get stuck in situations where your staff are panicking and visitors are frustrated because things aren't ready. For most disabilities, there's a lot that you can do to plan ahead. There, there are physical things like equipment that you can have ready all the time in the anticipation that somebody with a physical disability might need uh, an accommodation during a program. Now, I'm, I'm really kind of glad it's happened. This, I have a really kind of like goofy example right now that happened this morning. So I get wicked stage fright and I need Dr. Pepper when I'm gonna do a presentation. So, but because of the nerve problems in my hand, Bottle caps are horrible for me. So to open, to, so a bottle that has not been opened yet, I need a tool. You know, I need something to help. Where's my thing? I brought it with me. Hang on. I don't know where it is now, but I have one of those like gripper things that's got different sizes for like jars and bottle caps and things. So I'm at the school. I'm on campus and I don't have anything. So I'm like, okay, how am I gonna get this? How am I gonna get the soda bottle open? So. I found a seed clamp in an old toolbox. I don't even know why I have this clamp, but in a pinch, you can use some really weird things to get the job done. Um, so, you know, planning ahead is good. And, and I'm not telling everybody to keep a bunch of seed clamps available in the museum, but 
there's usually something around that you can use to adjust a physical environment or adjust the materials that you're using in programs and activities. Um, I recently, because of quarantine, because we're all trying to learn like 18 new hobbies, I decided I'm going to learn to play the drums, but I can't hold drumsticks without flinging them across the room. So I have a ring, I'm a drumstick, and this is the kind of product that you can buy in different sizes. Uh, this is specifically for drumsticks, but it's all this kind of little stuff, especially if you're working with art programs or classes where people have to hold uh, pencils or markers or paintbrushes, or people have to hold musical instruments. This is stuff that's not usually expensive that you can just have ready. Uh, so planning is good. Being flexible and going, all right, well, I don't have what I need. What can I use? And you know, sometimes you find yourself digging through drawers for, for things that you can use in a pinch. Um, I think one of the things that's important to remember, and Luke touched on it, is that you don't have to all of your accessibility problems all at once. And I said at the beginning, it's overwhelming, especially for organizations that might be having this conversation for the first time ever. And you go, wow, we did the checklist and look at all the stuff that we have to change and how we're going to pay for it, and we don't have staff, and we have limited time. You don't have to do it all at once. You just have to pick the things that you can do right now. You know, and part of the planning is sorting those uh, um, adjustments that need to be made into a plan so you have short-term fixes where, okay, well, we can buy an adjustable ramp and that will solve the front step problem. We can check that off pretty easily. But then maybe you want to install an elevator that's going to take, you know, years to get the money to do it and the planning and to be in architecture. So, uh, you know, planning, flexibility, and just accept that you can't do it all at once and nobody expects you to do it all at once as long as you just are trying and constantly moving forward and checking the boxes off of your to-do list. <clears throat> Excuse me. Great. That's some great points. Um, what is one takeaway that you hope people learn from this conversation? That it's everybody's responsibility. And I've been in conversations where, you know, it's usually bigger museums where you have more specialized departments. And so, you know, you have somebody who's in the education department who has like no authority over what happens in, you know, the exhibit design, you know, department. So there's usually kind of gaps in communication. And a lot of people will think, well, I don't have the authority to bring this up. Or they get nervous or, well, it's not really part of what I do or I'm not sure if it's what I do. It's everybody's job all the time to point these things out. And it doesn't matter if you work part time for minimum wage, you know, taking tickets at the at the entrance or if you're the CEO everybody's voice should be equally weighed, you know, and I, I joke, you know, if you teach something, say something, you know, you, obviously it's usually used in a, in a, a not fun context. This is a good context. If you see something, say something and put it in writing too, because sometimes the larger an organization is, the easier it is for those issues to get lost in the pipeline as I got kind of passed around between department heads for smaller organizations. Um, you know, be patient with yourself and be forgiving of yourself is important too. And then also kind of circling back specifically to the ADA is uh, the ADA guidelines are the minimum, the minimum, the absolute minimum that we're expected to do. Oh, why are we okay with the minimum? You know, in every aspect of designing programs and exhibits and performances, you know, when you're sitting down with your team, you always think, all right, how can we make this the best thing we've done ever? That attitude needs to also be applied towards accessibility and inclusion. So the checklists are the minimum that you're supposed to do. But I tell people, aim for the maximum. You know, put the, you know, sky's the limit the best case scenario, put it on the list and aim for that, knowing that, you know, you're going to struggle sometimes to get there because of, you know, real limitations about budget and architectural things like that. Yeah, I, oh, I love that so much. And I saw a question come through about 
how do you start a conversation um, about accessibility within an organization? And I think you make a good point that um, we said it earlier, 20, 20 to 25% of your community is going to be a person who identifies as having a disability. And there are people who, who, who would like to have accommodations who don't even identify with that. So I think it's an easy conversation to start to say, a quarter of our community are people with disabilities. This should be something that we're really um, starting each conversation with when we're talking about a, a performance, an exhibit, um, an activity, because that's a large part of our community. Right. Um, oh, well, I'll yeah. add to that. Um, also, if you are running an organization and you don't see people with disabilities come through your doors, there's a reason why. It's because you're not accessible. It's because they don't feel welcome. It's because they've had a bad past experience because maybe staff you know, didn't have the training that they needed to respond to things. So if nobody with a disability is coming to your events, that's a problem. You know, so that's also kind of a good thing to keep in mind. And I kind of, I tell people, especially sometimes people who are nervous because they're not, you know, at management level or executive level, keep a notebook in your pocket. And every single time you have a situation come up about accessibility, write it down, document it all, because you don't want, you know, you don't want it to always be considered of an anecdotal, you know, kind of fringe thing. You want to be able to show somebody, look, in the past month, I've had 17 people with the same thing. This is a problem. You know, so data is really important, too. Yeah, great point. Um, I'm going to invite everyone, all of our guest speakers, to join us on the screen again, um, because we're going to do an, the Q&A time welcome back everybody um and so here's a question what if i do or say something wrong when it comes to accessibility have any of you guys maybe started in the wrong direction and had to backtrack or or do something differently because you thought this was the accommodation you needed but really it was not correct Yeah, I'll, let me let me jump in on that real quick. Um, the the biggest suggestion I have is listen to the needs, um, listen to to what the public is telling you, because as as individuals um, who may be able bodied or or may not be uh, aware of that disability, we may not have the answers. Um, and and it's okay to ask questions. It's okay to ask a, a patron when they come to the door, "Can I help you?" instead of just grabbing their, perhaps grabbing their wheelchair and pushing them in. Uh, it, it's important to remember that assistive devices like a wheelchair, like clutches, are an extension of a person's body. And you know, when you reach out to, to talk to someone and you lean on their wheelchair, it's in essence, you're leaning on that individual. So those, those sort of mistakes are things that, that um, people will tell you, and that's, and that's okay. And I think in my experience, individuals with disabilities aren't afraid to tell you and be honest that, hey, I don't need that assistance or, or could you do something different? So just listen. I have, um, I have an example of, and it's something, it's, it's burned in my memory forever, something that I did when I first moved to Indianapolis and started the museum program. I was working as a volunteer in community arts classes for people with disabilities and basically I just kind of helped set up. I walked around, I kind of interacted with the art students, and students with cognitive disabilities and you know helped them interact and cleaned up. That was my job I did it a couple times a week. So you know it was the same, usually the same people every week during like an eight-week session. So a new group of students come in and sometimes a caregiver or a parent or something will come in with them. So there's a young man who was in a wheelchair, nonverbal, um, by physical appearance, physical appearance, very limited physical abilities, you know, had to, you know, holding paintbrushes with kind of a Velcro strap so he could hold it, or his caregiver would hold it in his hand. And every week, you know, I'd go around, I would talk to everybody, oh, how's it doing? You know, how, what are you making and stuff? And, you know, he, I caught myself one night because I approached and 
I like to tell really corny jokes and make, you know, silly one-liners and just kind of be the entertainer. So I, you know, I go up the table and what are we making? And I said something and he started laughing so hard. He looked right at me and started laughing so hard. And in that moment, I realized, oh my God, I've been completely ignoring him for like three weeks because I would go over and I would talk to his caregiver. And I didn't realize I did that. And in the beginning, I talked about like attitude, attitude barriers. So without even realizing it and completely unmaliciously, I assumed based on his physical appearance that he was also not mentally aware of what was going on. And I wanted to kind of crawl under a rock and die. I felt horrible. But immediately, I, I changed my behavior. I realized it about myself. So I would come in and I would talk directly to him and I would, pay, I would watch him. And his eyes would follow whoever was speaking. He, he knew what was going on in some level. I don't know what level, but I was very wrong in that. And, you know, so, you know, we all kind of do that and need to just kind of take a breath and say, you know what, it wasn't malicious and I didn't intend it and I'm just going to do better <laughs> going forward. You know, it wasn't a confrontation, but it was one of those like, aha, oh, that was really bad moments that I learned about myself and had to adjust my own behavior. Yeah, great, great. Um, there's another question about what are some resources I can use to learn more about how to be accessible? Um, like, Alia, I know you did research before you started your program. Can you talk a little bit about your research process? Our program, um, <laughs> there's not a lot of places to go to find um, classes for people with special needs in dance and you had to do a lot of searching and i was i was fortunate to have a relative who has a movable chair um, we don't call it a wheelchair it's a movable chair <laughs> um, and she was taking ballet at maryland ballet um, and she doesn't have um movement of her lower limbs her arms move but there um, there's limited mobility um, and I talked to them because my cousins and they told me how to get started. Um, but I didn't realize I would be teaching blind children. Um, and when you deal with blind, it's different than the movable chair. Um, it's different when you're dealing with a, a deaf person. Um, every, every thing that we have in this ability world is different and we can't make assumptions and limit people based on our notions and beliefs so you you sometimes you're going to have to look think out the box and then sometimes you're just going to have to we're artists create <laughs> just create. and i think someone said ask questions ask the questions and start using your creative juices let it flow awesome Anyone else have um, some quick resource, um, like websites or um, people that you go to in your community? There, there are resources available in nearly every community. You just need to know where to ask. Up in the Northeast Indiana region, we've got the AWS Foundation. We've got the League for the Blind and Disabled. Those organizations want their clients. They want their individuals to be able to participate. They are asking for people to come and ask questions. They know more than any of us. <clears throat> and I say, search out those organizations, ask them questions, because they're going to want to be your, your ally in this the whole way. We can't hear you, Stephanie. There, I don't know why my unmute button wasn't working. The, the Zoom was just telling me to just stop, okay? Um, no, yeah, I, I agree. Just kind of Googling a little bit will also help. Um, Great Lakes ADA is kind of our Midwest um, expert organization for Americans with Disabilities Act related things. Um, you can call me and we can chat through if you um, want to. I do that a lot with our grantees or our applicants about well, this is my specific outdoor festival scenario and who can I talk to? And I either can connect you with someone I know like Luke who's done festivals outdoors or I can um, talk through some scenarios um, with you and we can figure it out. Um, 
I also want to mention that at the Indiana Arts Commission last year, we uh, decided to start an advisory group that we mentioned before. Chris is a part of the Accessibility in the Arts Advisory Committee. And um, that's something I recommend. And, and I don't know, um, Chris, if you have seen at other museums or other arts organizations, um, advisory committees with that have people with disabilities on it. Um, is that something you think is a, a good idea that organizations could do for finding the answers they need? I think, yeah, I mean, I think that it, like the advisory committee route can happen at a lot of different levels. So, you know, and depending on the size of your organization, if there are people who live right there in our community, you can ask them and they could be like an ad hoc committee where if you have something specific come up, you call them in. I've done that where I've gotten an email and say, hey, we're doing this project, can you give us some feedback? And so, okay. On an as needed basis, they have kind of a pool of people who are willing to pop in, look over what they're doing, or, you know, review some documents and just give advice, and then you're done. Um, or like our committee is more formal, where we have, you know, scheduled meetings and an agenda uh, as like an ongoing process. There's also, um, it's becoming very popular, and I'm very excited about it now that there's lots of regional committees or councils that some are actually independent nonprofits, some are just, you know, professional networks. Um, like in the Chicago area, there's Chicago Cultural Arts Access Consortium, and they've established as a 5123, and they have, uh, they have a board, of, you know, they have officers, they have advisors, they give programs, they have a listserv, so, uh, you know, a, a bigger regional area, you can sign up for listservs and get emails about what's going on. Or if you have a question, like you can submit that into the listserv and it goes out to everybody and you start having these conversations because you'll have, you know, at least one or two people say, hey, we do that at our museum or this is how we fix that at our place. Um, and then uh, the ADA network, going back to just general resources, has like an anonymous hotline they have webinars, they have archived uh, information. So for more of those like sticky legal questions, you can just call in and say, all right, here's what's going on, I need some help. And they may be able to refer you to groups in your area. Um, there's wow. a lot of different levels. That's great. Um, and I will add too that um, asking people with disabilities for input is vital, is so important, but also if you are going to form uh, maybe a more regularly meeting committee, you should consider compensating those people for their time and expertise. And we do that with our advisory committee, um, you know, a stipend that's not a ton of money, but it is, you know, uh, I think a gesture that, that tells people that you value their time, just as we advocate for paying artists for their time as well. Um, I just wanted to add that. And we are wrapping up here. Thank you everyone for being on this webinar. You all had great um, experiences to share, great input, and I value you and your time. And I'm gonna hand it over to our marketing director, Bridget Eckert, who will close us out. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Um, like Stephanie said, my name is Bridget. I'm a white woman in my 20s and I'm wearing a teal shirt and there's a bookcase behind me. I'd like to thank everyone who joined us on Facebook today uh, to learn more about the ADA and to celebrate this great moment in our country's history. Like Chris said, there's a lot more to do. The ADA is the minimum. And um, which brings me to say thank you, of course, to all of our guest speakers. Alia and Luke, of course, Chris, and my colleague Stephanie for pushing our agency to, to make a real celebration out of this week. Um, we hope you join us over on Facebook and Instagram the rest of the week for more content. And we will be sending out a recording of this webinar along with some of the resources that were mentioned as well sometime tomorrow. Um, so like my colleague Stephanie said, if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to the Indiana Arts Commission. We are here to help and to learn with you. I hope everyone has a great rest of their afternoon. Bye-bye.